Before going into the topic details, I want to bring your attention to the UPSC coaching programs offered by Clear IAS. Clear IAS offers online and offline courses to help candidates get selected for prestigious government services like IAS, IPS, or IFS. Clear IAS, Prelims, Come Mains, PCM course, provides a highly effective study plan, well-organized subject-wise videos, study materials, mock exams, and guidance to cover the entire GS syllabus of UPSC CSE prelims, mains, and interview systematically. As a limited period offer, there is a 40% discount on our online courses. Enroll now. See, when you see the textbook, you will see that constitutional bodies will not consist of the President of India, the Prime Minister of India, the Supreme Court. Are they not constitutional? Hmm? Do you think that the President of India, the office of the President of India, is it constitutional or non-constitutional? What do you think? Hmm? Is it constitutional or non-constitutional? Article number 52 of the Indian Constitution says that there shall be a president of India. So it is a constitutional body. There is absolutely no doubt. But when you see the list in the textbook, Indian Polity by M. Lakshmi Khan, you won't see the office of president of India. The prime minister of India, is it constitutional? Prime minister? Is it constitutional? Yes, absolutely. Article number 74 of the Indian Constitution says that there shall be a council of ministers headed by the Prime Minister to aid and advise the President of India. That is good enough to make understanding that it is a constitutional body. The Supreme Court of India. Is it a constitutional body? Absolutely, it is a constitutional body. Article number 124 speaks about there shall be a Supreme Court of India consisting of a Chief Justice of India, not more than seven other judges until the Parliament by law prescribes otherwise. So, all of these institutions are constitutional institutions. But these institutions does not get a mention in your textbook, in the chapter which is titled as the constitutional bodies. What is the reason, do you think? Is it because of the reason that Lakshmi Khan has decided that, okay, fine, I will skip some of the topics from this to make it simple? Hmm? What do you think is the reason? Fine. So basically what you need to understand is that. See, this is how you will have to understand and ask questions to yourself. Is it a constitutional body? If so, why is it not mentioned in that list? So what you need to understand is that. See, basically our constitution deals with three organs of government, which you know that is executive, legislature and judiciary. Executive, legislature and judiciary. And they deal with general matters, not specific ones, general matters. Isn't it? Can the Prime Minister say that, no, I will not interfere in this matter? Can the President say that, no, I will not interfere in this matter? This law is a new subject, I won't interfere. Is it possible? No. Can the Supreme Court say that, no, 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 I won't hear the cases related to this matter? Is it possible? No. They are general when we speak about a constitutional democracy or when you speak about a democratic government, executive, legislature and judiciary, these are the three organs of government which comes under the category of general organs of the government. These are inevitable for a democratic form of government. But when you talk about the other bodies, that is, when you speak about the executive, legislature and judiciary, they are general in perspective. Now, beyond this, there are certain institutions that deals with specific matters. Or there are other institutions that are very much specialists. Fine. That is what you need to understand is the reason why the office of the President, Prime Minister, the Supreme Court is not mentioned in the list of constitutional bodies. Because they are not specific, they are generalists. Fine. Say for example, when you speak about the Election Commission of India, deals with the matters only in relation to the election. Yes, 
when you speak about the Union Public Service Commission, it deals with the matters of recruitment, merit, isn't it? When you speak about, say, for example, the Central Bureau of Investigation deals with the matters of the crime, or you may say that the corruption, all those kind of things, isn't it? The Central Vigilance Commission also deals with those matters in relation to the corruption, isn't it? The University Grants Commission deals with the matters of recommending the grants for the different universities in India. So they have very specific duties and functions. Fine. So that is the reason why you do not see these offices as part of the list which is provided in the text. Fine. Excuse me. The reason is that these have very Sir. specific matters to deal with. So you have understood that these are the reasons or this is one of the reason why there is Okay So these are the reason why there is no mention of the office of the president, the prime minister, the supreme court in the list of the constitutional bodies So that is the reason what you need to understand fine Now when it comes to the definition of constitutional body you need to understand that an institution that is created drawing the power or ex extending the power from a provision of the constitution is what do you mean by a constitutional body say for example the election commission of india article number 324 says that the power for the superintendent's control and coordination of the elections lies with the Election Commission of India, both at the central and at the state level. Article number 148 deals with the Office of Comptroller and Auditor General of India. So, Article number 148 says that there shall be a Comptroller and Auditor General for India. Fine. So, some institutions created drawing the power from a provision of the constitution is what do you mean by a constitutional body? Fine. Those institutions that will not come under the category of constitutional bodies are basically known as non-constitutional bodies, which means those institutions created without, without the foundation or without the source of power from the constitution of India, that is what do you mean by non-constitutional body. And non-constitutional bodies can be further classified into statutory bodies as well as non-statutory bodies. So can you give any example for a statutory body? Example for a statutory body? What? Hmm? National Human Rights Commission is an example for a statutory body. Information Commission is an example for a statutory body. At the same time, non-statutory body. Can you give an example? Hmm? Niti Aayog is an example for a non-statutory body. So why do we say that these are the examples respectively for the statutory and non-statutory bodies? What is the reason? Yeah, when you speak about the National Human Rights Commission, when you speak about the Information Commission, these are created from the power which is given by an act of the parliament. Fine, act of the legislature. Say for example, when you speak about the National Human Rights Commission, there is an act which is known as the Protection of Human Rights Act. The Protection of Human Rights Act. So there is an act. There is an action of the legislature which actually supports the establishment of a statutory body. So this is what do you mean by a statute. Statute means an act of the parliament or the state legislature does not matter. The statute is act. So those body created under the authority of a statute is known as statutory body 
those bodies created under the authority of a constitution is known as constitutional body. Fine. So similarly, when we speak about the Information Commission, you know that the right to information act. The Right to Information Act. This is it. But these institutions, say for example, the TIO, it is not created with the backing of an act. Niti Ayog was created through an executive resolution in 2015. It is not through the act of the parliament. It is just through the action of the executive. So act of the parliament means it is the action of the legislature. Action of the executive means it is a kind of the matters decided by the prime minister and the council of ministers, not the parliament of India. Right? So that is how Niti Aayog is created with the executive resolution of the cabinet. But... These institutions are statutory bodies. Why? Because it has got a backing of an act. Right? So that is the difference between statutory and non-statutory body. And many of the statutory bodies, as well as non-statutory bodies, even the constitutional bodies have got quasi-judicial functions also. What do you mean by quasi-judicial functions? Quasi-judicial functions. What do you mean by quasi-judicial? Judicial powers. Quasi-judicial means it is the judicial powers, judicial powers exercised by the executive. Fine. This is what you mean by quasi-judicial function. The executed performing the judicial function. This is what you mean by quasi-judicial function. Say, for example, the Election Commission of India is an executive. There is no doubt. The Union Public Service Commission is an executive. There is no doubt. The Election Commission of India deals with the disputes in relation to the election matters. So, it has got something which is in relation to the judicial powers, but is it the General Judiciary, the Election Commission of India, will it come under the Executive, Legislative legislative and Judiciary Departments? No, it is out of that. And that is the reason why it is known as quasi-judicial bodies. Fine. So let me ask you one thing. What do you refer to the legislative functions performed by the Executive? Hmm? The legislative functions performed by the executive. What do you mean by this? Or what will you refer or which term do you usually use for the legislative powers exercised by the executive? Huh? Ordinance. Yeah, what this process is known as? Yeah, ordinance is one of the legislative power exercised by the executive. Yeah, fine. But what this process is known as? Handing over the power from the legislature to the executive. Hmm? This process is known as, that is handing over the power from the legislature to the executive. This process is known as delegated legislation okay do not forget this term it is delegated legislation delegated legislation so what is the idea the idea is that there is a parliament of india isn't it there is a parliament of india and what is the function of the parliament basically is to frame laws isn't it parliament will basically frame laws Say, for example, the parliament will frame a law. Example is the Citizenship Act. Citizenship Act 
of 1955. So if there is a term which is referred as act, it is the action of the legislature. That is the parliament or the state legislature. Fine. So the parliament frames this law in such a way that the parliament will just create an overview. Or you may say the parliament will create only, only an outline. The parliament will not mention each and everything in the law. And the parliament will say that, say for example, according to clause 2 of the Citizenship Act of 1955, we hereby pass the power to the union government to make this law in action. Fine. So that is the reason you might have heard about recently the citizenship amendment rules issued by the central government. And what is this? This is delegated legislation. That means the Parent Act passes the power to the executive. Why? Because the parliament of India will have to perform many functions. Many functions. Even if the parliament performs the functions 24 hours a day, for 365 days, it will not be possible for the parliament to meet all the requirements of the crores of people of India. So, is it logical, is it viable that each and every time all the members of the parliament will have to come to the new parliamentary building of New Delhi and decide whether that needs to be passed or enacted or some changes needs to be met? Is it practically possible? Say, for example, during the time of Corona, suppose if there is a need of an urgent law. Is it possible for the entire parliament members from the country, the whole country to come and sit in New Delhi and decide? Is it practically possible? No. But what will be done? They will pass the power to the executive so that the prime minister and the council of ministers, a small body, they can decide the matter. And this is what you mean by delegated legislation. Fine. So what you need to understand is that the judicial powers exercised by the executive is known as quasi-judicial functions. The legislative powers exercised by the judiciary is known as, sorry, the executive is known as delegated legislation. Fine. Do you think any problem with this delegated legislation? Hmm? Do you think that it is constitutional? Do you think that it is constitutional? Hmm? There is an element of unconstitutionality you may see. When it comes to the American constitution, you can say. Why? Because there is a strict separation of power doctrine in US. But in India, we does not have the rigid separation of power between the executive legislature and judiciary. And that is the reason why delegated legislation is permissible. Up to some extent. Otherwise, it may be violating the doctrine of separation of power. Isn't it? You just imagine that the executive is framing the law. According to the constitution, who will have to frame the law? The legislature. So, if the executive is given the power to frame the law, don't you think that it is violation of the constitution? But our constitution provides that permission. Fine. Our constitution provides that permission. Why? Because of the different nature of India. We need to deal with the population. So some changes needs to be taken or some decision needs to be taken as soon as possible. So for that, we are not supposed to depend on the all entire members of the parliament. That is not possible. So we have given the power to the executive. Clear? Fine. So this is what is delegated legislation. A new topic. Understand delegated legislation. Okay. Delegated legislation. Fine. Right? So that's what you need to understand regarding the categorization of constitutional and non-constitutional bodies.